Right. What's up, everybody? It is Sunday, 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 February 18th, and it is episode 40, 40 of One of a Kind with RVD. And guess who's here? It's Rob Van Dam. No way, dude. Hey. <laughs> I am fantastic. Great. Damn, damn fine on a Sunday. We like to keep our our viewers on their toes. Keep That's them right. guessing. <laughs> when we're gonna do a show. That's right. We say six o'clock, but it could be just could be a little after six o'clock. That's all. Well, I can tell you uh right now, because we usually do Thursdays, right? Yep. I happen to have traveling plans on this Thursday. Oh which usually I'm not able to uh to talk about in advance, but it's all over the uh social media people know. I am uh, booked Wednesday for AEW, so uh, I'll be traveling home on on Thursday. But um, it's not; it's only happened once that I've gotten booked this far in advance before by them. So uh, six man tag coming up. Yes, very exciting, very exciting. It's uh, I'll we'll actually talk about that in a little bit. But w- Rob, what is, is there's something else that's on your mind? Something else that's been uh, you want to? Talk about you. you want to get back? You want to get back to that? Because I'm. Uh, yeah, we'll got, get back to that. Actually, I, I have that on tap. But there's something else. Yeah, I figured. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, I was just you know I watched a lot of YouTube. I wrote down a couple things. I thought, I don't know, I'd bring them up, or I would, uh, or maybe blatantly like this, or maybe see if we can fit it in organically. Um, but I don't know. Maybe I, maybe I want to go through everything. I kind of end up getting quite a quite a quite a big list and um you, stuff that's in the news i thought might be worth talking about you know how about scott demore getting the boot yeah that's what well, yeah that's exact that's something else actually i had on the list too to talk i figured about. if i did this if we if you started with was on my mind i figured i'd probably kill your list anyway so right away i thought maybe it's not a good idea but but anyway um i saw quite a, a bit on that you know in the in the, the wrestlers seem to be so upset about it you know they they wrote a letter i guess to anthem about their feelings um and so you you know scott's uh he's he's loved by the dressing room everybody seems to be giving him credit for anything good that's happened in the direction of uh tna or impact wrestling and um and, and, and I haven't heard any dirt about him. You know, I haven't heard, you know, he got fired because of this or that. It's all just been about reorganizing the office. And, uh, you know, so I just thought that was worth bringing up. Uh, I've known Scott for a long, 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 long time, just like everybody in the business. Um, I remember, actually, I worked him in Indiana one time. This would have been like 90, between 96 and 98. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Sabu was helping the guy for, that had taken over the USWA territory, at least part of it. Mike Samples was his name. That oh, sound okay. familiar? Yeah, it does sound a little familiar. Yeah, Mike Samples. I'm gonna Google. Am I messing his last name? I think that's his name. And uh, anyway, he was running some of the towns, and, and Sabu was helping him. Um, you know, book guys. He brought me in. And uh, Rip Rogers also was bringing guys in, and it was weird because there, there was literally uh, a, a rope with a curtain that went down the dressing room, and there was Rip's guys and there was Sabu's guys, and they didn't agree on stuff. You know what I mean? It wasn't like it was good guys, bad guys. It was more like they had separate ideas on how to help Mike out and how to build the territory, and they both had – invested interest in doing that and i was there obviously on sabu's side and i wrestled uh, scott demore this kid from canada that um sabu knew i don't know if you met him down there or if you met him somewhere else but you know just like always uh get a good word in from uh sabu and and that that met you know we're on the he's a good guy you know what i mean Can, yeah. reference went a long way um <laughs> And it, but he's the one that hired me when I went back to TNA um, the last time, you know, in 2000, uh, uh, I guess it was 19, 
COVID, yeah. COVID, yeah, yeah. 19 or 20, I guess. Um, but yeah, I remember like, uh, he always tried to book me over the years. I'd always get a message or a phone call from him like every couple of years and he would want to book me and um, I would give him my price and that would always end the conversation. <laughs> that would <be>, do it. <laughs> At least 10, 15 years that, that happened, at least. And then, um, and then one time, you know, he was saying, well, you know, we're going to be doing some things. I, I see a spot for you here at uh, TNA. And, and he came out here to, uh, to Las Vegas and we met at the nerd bar and, uh, and he had a spiel to give me. And he was saying, you know, I, I, I see you as being like, uh, like our new sting, you know, where you're the veteran, um, you know, we don't have to work you to death or, or whatever, but boom, boom, boom. And I'm um, at the time, like my back was bothering me, you know, and I let him know I was up front, you know, like, you know, I'm, Right now, you know, I'm a little banged up. Sometimes I am, sometimes I'm not. Um, and we had a good talk, you know, and obviously it went well because uh, I got hired and, and was there. And in the end, in the end, um, looking back, what is that noise? Oh, that's on the other side of the wall. Um, looking back at the uh, at the deal forever, how long I was there, um, at first, you know, it was, uh, I mean, it was my, my, my standards, my terms. Then they brought in, uh, and Sabu was there and they brought in Katie. And then I was like, wow, they're really trying to, you know, make this, make me happy and, and stuff. Um, but then in the end, when, when we were done, we were just done and looking back at it, you know, like how, how was Scott to work with? It was, it was like fine, you know, but, um, I feel like both of my runs with TNA that they respected me too much to talk to me. Really? Uh, yeah. So I never got feedback on if they liked what was going on or anything. Uh, I remember shortly, right before I uh, finished up there, you know, and then they were just like, we really don't have anything else for you. And I didn't have a deal. So it wasn't like I was let go or anything. It was always every week I figured it was going to be my last week. And Scott would say, all right, well, we'll see you at the next tapings in October. I'd be like, okay like i always thought that they weren't using me in a way that they would get their money back out of me from my opinion and so i never put too much faith in that you know being a long lasting long lasting thing but but in the end i mean i you know there's i still i don't know like don't know even how he felt you know whatever it was more more just it was always cool to me respectful and like hey you know more like just one of the boys though like never Never was I ever given that I can remember any like direction or, Hey, we want you to, you know, help build this kid up or whatever. Boom, boom, boom. It was always, you know, just, um, let me be me. Go and do your thing, so to speak. Yeah. There was one time I asked a question to Scott and it was like, uh, my back was bothering me and I was, uh, I had, uh, I, someone just introduced me to white claws. So I was <laughs> really, yeah, comment below. I know I'm a pussy, um, but uh, well, without name dropping, you know, someone had gone to the store and gotten some, and and I was drinking a few of them, and uh, and I was watching the matches. I think I'd already worked, and I was critiquing them like I do at home, you know, like mm, boom, and and I asked Scott that time, you know, I said, do you do you want me to, you know, if I can can see things that could help the guys, you know, to like say things to them or, or or not or that's not something you expect from me or whatever and he was just like he gave some like real shrug off no answer answer you know um and i didn't know how i felt about it but it's like uh but we were gone like <laughs> like maybe two trips later it was like real quick afterwards we were gone so me and katie joke like uh that but but it, but it was something where at the the next day or taping i guess it was the next day whatever dilo actually said something to me and said hey man you can't be in the uh you can't be drinking 100 white claws uh, in the dressing room and i looked at him and i was and i was just like so many mixed feelings so many mixed feelings and i was just like i'm just gonna let him say that he was told to say that and uh so i was just like okay you know, I wasn't going to argue it or whatever, unless it went any further. And then he was just like, okay, this is me telling you. And he left. But, man, 
he was talking to another wrestler that was drinking beer in the exact same room. <laughs> and if I wanted to say something about it, you know, I could have been like, hey, 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 hey. Yeah, right. Hey. Yeah. But, um, but really, that's all I got to say. Do you think they brought it up because it was White Claws? You were drinking White Claws? Maybe. (laughs) Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I really don't know. I like White Claws. Uh, (laughs) I don't have a... I don't care. (laughs) You know? That was the first... It may be last time I drank them. I don't know. Um, But but anyway, I was like, man, you know, if someone could do a beer run, you know, like... I can't remember what... I think it was my back. Something was really hurting me. Used to always be my back. Um... But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Whatever the reason was, I was just like, all right, this dude's doing his job. He was told to say that. Okay, you told me. I think I might have said that. Yeah. So, yeah, this is just me telling you. But, but then, yeah, I, I, want, I almost want to say that because he's talking to somebody while they're drinking a beer in the same room the next night. And, uh, you know, I, if I want to make a big deal, I could have taken a picture. But, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, not really much to say. Uh, you know, Scott's just always been cool to me, but I don't really know what it's like working with him, except very, very passive from my perspective. Yeah, um, you do hear a lot. I mean, you mentioned the letter and stuff that got written and everything. And um, there has been several times where it seems like Scott was the big proponent that TNA still is alive at this juncture. Because, like, there's been so many <laughs> moments where they've been dead in the water, dead in the water, dead in the water. And then uh, yeah. they keep coming back. And then rebrand was all him with the, the TNA. Mm-hmm. When I was with them in 2010, 2011, 2012, there was always a rumor that that was going to be their last week. They were going to be shut down, you know, way back with – Panda Energy funding it, and then uh, every everything, you know. I was like, okay, you know, I'll just I'll let you know when my checks bounce. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> happened. that's it. Never happened. That's it. But mm-hmm. yeah, and then there was the some rumors that he was actually he made a play to buy TNA actually uh, before he got let go. Um, like yeah, that. I understand that his uh, his family is uh, pretty well off, and I guess. That was something, uh, a realistic option for him to consider was to buy the company. And yeah, from what I understand, it seems like maybe he might have saw this coming and thought that would have been a better option that they they chose not to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then on top of it, too, um, yeah, you mentioned it, like you kind of giving advice to wrestlers after that you see their matches and stuff like that. That's like... That's pretty good value right there, you know? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. You know, a lot of veterans just take it upon themselves, and uh, and I don't. I definitely yeah. don't feel obligated or feel like they're obligated to listen to me. And as as has been discussed a lot of times with AEW, some of the guys that are even uh, vet, veterans above me that I grew up with and uh, say – that they don't get asked, you know, by the young guys uh, to watch their matches or advice or whatever. But then I do, you know, someone, someone took that part from our podcast, left out the part where I said, but I do. And that's the point of it is that, you know, that goes a long way. Like, I'm not going to go up to somebody and say, Hey, I noticed, you know, when I was watching your match, I mean, really that could be taken as rude, you know, that could be like uh, back when Raven told me in 96, you know what you need? You know what's keeping you from being a big star? A ring jacket. A ring jacket. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was his advice. <laughs> like, uh, thanks, buddy. I'll consider that. You just start coming out in a denim jacket. <laughs> I don't know. Some advice is unwanted, and I personally have had enough unwanted advice through my years of uh resisting conformity and sticking to my guns enough to appreciate the value of someone that says hey if i want to hear from you i'll I'll let you know (laughs) do you think that's an overall kind of thought process in the business too is like hey you know it's almost like when somebody's kind of working out or something like that in the gym some people think it's like a faux pas to kind of almost come up to somebody and tell them what they're doing wrong exactly is that kind of the overall mentality when it comes yeah, to Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I really think it has to do with the individual's personality on how much if they're a more of a um, internal, you know, keep to myself kind of person or, or if they're, uh, you know, someone that's more outgoing. I think that has a lot to do with it. And also, I think for a lot of people, 
like that respect that they feel like they earned by putting their time in is all they got. Yeah. And, um, you know, we've talked, uh, uh, me and Katie have talked about wrestlers that some of them, man, they, they put, they paid their dues. They put everyone over on their way up and they thought it was just supposed to automatically pay back and it'd be their time someday. But for whatever reason, whether they don't sell tickets, they're not marketable, they're, they're missing that special something, whatever it is, you know, they don't get a chance to either make big money, to be a big recognizable star, to have some of the benefits that go with their dream. So instead, all they got is that they're a veteran. All they got is that they've got, you know, 15 years in, They've been on TV getting beat by the best. And so for them, that means everything. So they're going to be wanting to come over to you and, 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 and make sure that when you look at them, you're, you're looking in the right direction and that's up. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. According to them, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely a kind of a different mentality for it too. Um, Yeah. Well, you did mention uh, entitlement. Yeah. 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 Very much. so. Yeah. But uh, you did mention it back on Dynamite this Wednesday, and you and that triple tag. It's uh, you uh, tagging up with Hangman Page, tagging up with uh, Hook. So Choke and Smoke is back in business. And uh, then you're going up against Moa Joe, Swerve Strickland, and oh my gosh, oh, Brian Cage. Uh, everybody you have a history with at this point now, Rob. Um, you know what's so funny to me about this is on social media, um, more than anything, I feel like I've seen surprise and people are like, how random and out of nowhere, like what? What this match doesn't mean anything. Tony sucks. And and what's funny is if you listen to every interview I've done since my last TV, I said, well, I think I left them with something where they got to bring me back for at least a tag match, if not, you know, uh, an A man, because I think isn't Swear part of like a four man crew or something. He's got the um. Oh, what's the name of that? Nana. Uh, yeah, Nana's Nana, there, Nana. and then he loose ties with Brian Cage because I think Nana manages Brian Cage as well. Oh. Yes. Okay. Fact. Someone told me he was part of a four man team. Maybe it's three, but either way, um, you know, it made perfect sense to me. Kate, did you guys not see Cage come in towards the end of my right. match? And pushed me off the top rope. Like, you don't think I want to go get him back for that? And you haven't seen me in hook tag. But anyway, <laughs> it makes perfect sense to me. And yeah. um, I and and so you know, they booked this. Um well, I guess uh when did they book it? I don't know, at least a week ahead. Enough time for me to call Joe Holland, my airbrush yeah. artist, and say, Joe, they called me again, dude. And I'm thinking, you know, he's been man he's been doing my outfits forever you know that like since since the very first airbrushed outfits in uh, 95. wow yeah that's wild yeah and and they just gotten bit better more elaborate i've got so many of them and he doesn't like me to wear uh wear them more than once if i don't have to so i'm already thinking man he's he's busy i've been getting him to kick him out you know now i've had four aew matches and i think i think he got you know got me a new outfit every time so you know, I, I don't want to press my luck. I was thinking, like, maybe I'll wear that white one again that I wore with Hook. And, and you know, boom, guess what he sent me. So You got it already. Unveiling, if that's the right Ooh, word. I guess yeah. the right word. Unboxing. So, These YouTubers like the, the, the unboxing, Rob. The opening of the box. I, I, I ripped it open. I haven't seen the outfit yet, but I, I was ripping it open when we were talking earlier. And now I'm pulling out the color... Of yin and yang, black and white. Ooh, all right. Damn, lots of detail on that. I got to make sure I look tan as fuck <laughs> to wear white. Man, you can't even tell it's white, though. There's a lot of paint on this one. Holy cow. That one looks fucking sweet. Whoa, what? <laughs> Dude, I love it. Yeah. Is it? Are those dice? They're dice. What? Oh, sweet. Yeah, look at that. First, I thought they were ghosts or, or <laughs> something. And can you see? Oh yeah, I see the dice. Oh yeah, it's uh, it's more apparent. I think on the back, I can see some of the square edges. Dude, that's badass. 
Bam. Fuck hey. you, dude. Heck yeah. Rolling the dice, rolling thunder. Sweet. Thank you, Joe Holland, as always, helping me uh, still impress the fuck out of motherfuckers. <laughs> How looking long? good, looking good, standing still, looking even better when I'm moving. So how long does like so when did you notify him about that? And then so how long did you think that took him to do or typically make a outfit like that? Um man, that's a great question. Uh I think he got that done in a day. I don't know how much of that day he spent painting. I don't know if he does more than one coat. Uh, I know a lot of it, it, it the important part is drying. Yeah. He just made an outfit for Katie, got it all done, and then while it was drying he bumped something hot that's like an iron that fell over on it and burned a hole in it. And he was so upset about it and still is. Uh, but um, sometimes that happens. I remember that happened to one of my outfits back in ECW too. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's, man, I, I don't know. I, 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 I did not think I'd be doing it this long. I told Joe years ago, like, well, I probably got enough outfits to last me, you know, like, Chances of me going on TV and, and, and needing to look real fresh. Uh, you know, I got a few that are still decent. I can wear them a couple more times, but bam. You know what? I heard, I read something I really liked uh, from a fan, and they said that this year is going to be our maybe RVD's best year. How about and that? I, thought, I thought, why the fuck not? Yeah, you know? right. I got a lot of momentum going off the first month of January already, you know. Things are cooking. People, Things people are cooking. Are there, there aren't too many people with my physical abilities and my knowledge and my experience, you know? Absolutely. So that's something you can't take from me. Well, unless you break my legs maybe or something, but don't do that. Yeah, don't do that. No, there's several people here in the chat saying uh, they can't wait to see you. Adesha. That's right, I gotta open up the chat. And by the way, uh, Katie Forbes is a champion as well. That's right. Yeah, she won the uh, UWW championship last weekend, right, baby? Yeah, yeah. congrats, Katie. That's awesome. Congrats, baby. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> so, yeah, hey, this could be the year of Katie and Rob happening here, 2024. Fuck it, hey, man. It feels yeah. good. Got a lot of good stuff lined up. Um, some stuff, just like always, that I can't even talk about that I know people are going to be excited about. And uh, not to mention, man, I really enjoy filling up my schedule. I love being an independent uh, worker, you know? Like, I love yeah. when people call me and they're like, uh, I got two two bookings that are probably going to happen at marijuana dispensaries, you know, and that's, that's something that might open up like a whole new thing, which, um, which, you know, I've done, but usually um, that's like a different industry. So it's like, well, when I tell you what I get, you know, <laughs> my fee, you, I don't know if you're still going to be interested, you know, I don't know what you're used to, but um, anyway, um I forgot what I was going to say, but uh, a lot of stuff working out. Something I was going to say about um, industry, about a dispensary, about weed. Um, being independent? Like being independent? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I do. I, I love that. Just, you know, filling up my schedule, working out my own terms. And it's like, uh, there's always like that argument about how we're treated so badly because we're treated like independent contractors instead of employees. And I, I always stand on the other side of the fence. You know, I'm one of the only ones over here. There's got to be somebody besides me. Um, but I, I, I'm the wrestler that looks at, at it like, hey, I understand business. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You're, you want to you wanna add a union? And then to what? Like only to WWE or to everyone down to UWW? Right. <laughs> you know? Um, not everyone can afford it, obviously, but and and what's a union do, for my opinion, being somebody that swam upstream against all odds, made it to the top, fighting for everything I believed in, fighting to control my own pathology and 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 make every correct choice to get the life where I'm at right now and now get the rewards. And you're saying you want to what? even the playing field. So when guys start out, they get treated better. That's going to be a hard sell to me, bro. 
Yeah. There's a lot of elements that go into play with that too. Is just like, yeah, the, if you get, if you have a younger talent that already has that established, it's like there's that missing aspect of not being able to pay your dues, and th then you, the, you run into that issue what you were just saying, where it's like those smaller promotions, they, they're not going to be able to handle like a union kind of thing that they have to no. worry about. That's an added, that's an added turnoff for a lot of younger companies. I could maybe understand the value of like a huge, huge company like a WWE maybe doing something to that effect, but. Even that kind of has. And yeah, and if anyone money. listening to this conversation hasn't heard me talk about this before and they're feeling like, well, no, wait a minute, it'd be better. It'd be better if they at least had health insurance. I always win everybody over with this. If you disagree, leave a comment. Um, yeah. I've never had anybody disagree with this, but dear viewer, uh, I'm going to hire you. Um, whatever i'm gonna hire you to paint my fucking house all right i'm gonna set we're gonna work out the terms i want you to sign a contract that says you won't paint any other house until you're done with mine is that fair <laughs> yes well boom you already just shot down the argument about but you can't work for anybody else when you're a wrestler and blah 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 no that's how it is but that's not even where i was going to go that's just a point along the way but here yeah. is the point that I, that I want to say, would you rather I pay you uh, X amount of dollars a year and I will cover, um, you know, uh, a basic minimum health insurance package, or would you rather I pay you X, X dollars a year and you find your own insurance? You find your own insurance that fits you. Yeah. Everyone I ask agrees with me that it's better to have control over that. And if you don't want insurance, guess what? You're not forced to anyway. But um, anyway, I love being an independent contractor. It's always worked for me. And I'll let you know when that changes. <laughs> it used to be like, when I, man, when I left WWE in 2007, you know, and I was like, I went on my sabbatical. Um, that was scary. I was just telling Katie about this yesterday um as i'm filling up my schedule with these bookings i was i was afraid to it was scary as fuck you know i was taking a, a step of faith walking off a cliff blindfolded that's what it felt like and i kept saying that like i i just think something's gonna be there to catch my foot but i don't know what it is and i've been under a guaranteed check for so long and now i'm gonna leave on my own and, and not know where my money is going to come from. And I don't want to even fucking wrestle anymore. I mean, cause I was so burnt out. Yeah. And I was like, bro, it's not like, it's not like I'm like, like everyone always uh, brings this up that Matt Hardy says he's set for life. He said that 20 years ago when he was 15, you know what I mean? And that's, Hey, I, I don't live on the Hardy compound with what they did. I have, it costs a lot to be RVD. And um, anyway, um, you know, I love doing business and that's like, uh, um, they have not got spaced again. I'm talking about Hardy's. What was I talking about? You, um, you liked, uh, well, the fact that just being an independent contractor and then, um, oh my gosh, I'm trying to think too, Rob. You know why? You know why I got spaced? I want to talk about Jeff Hardy. You saw him get kneed in the face. Yes. Right? Yes. With Sammy Guevara did the, the, oh, the yeah, man, and yeah. Put the knees up. Yeah. That was crazy. You know, that's why they call it a high risk move. Um, I'm not throwing shade on anybody, you know, because accidents happen. God knows I've potatoed enough people during my matches. Um, but that's on Sammy completely. You know, that's a high risk move um, way back in like, I guess my whole career. I've always done the 450 into right. a bump, into a bump. I know if I landed on somebody, I would kill them and I would kill me. I, I I can't control that. But when I first started doing that, 91, 92, or I guess maybe even before I even got into the business, I don't know. But anyway, uh, but I know I've got footage of me doing it in Japan in 92. Before I went to WCW, when Two Cold Scorpio was doing it, I thought he copied me. I'd sent mm -hmm. them a demo tape, and I thought that they showed Scorpio and gave him my moves, and I was pissed because I'd never seen anybody do that. But he was landing it, and and, you know, I would do the 450 um, if if my target's rolling out of the way because the chance of me hurting them is almost 100%. So when you are doing flips and twists and all this stuff, 
the, the, the more you add to it, the higher risk it is, which is why the reward is greater. You get a bigger pop, whatever. But, you know, you're taking that that risk um, and you take a and it's a high risk. So when you fuck it up, it is on you, you know. Yeah. Just like if I try to do a, a springboard off the top rope and my foot slips, damn ropes, they're fucking oily. You know, <laughs> it's on me. Well, what was the hopefully best- Jeff will be okay? You know. Yeah, I think he. I think he got a solid. Broken nose. Yeah, broken I nose maybe. Okay, though I think he's okay. Overall. Concussion. Yeah, I see. That's a good question. If he got a concussion or not, that's what I'm not sure about. But. uh yeah, you talked about what was the one move that you were doing that you were like, oh, I got to stop doing this because it might it's hurting people too much or something like that. There's like a. Uh, yeah, I used to do a uh, double underhook front. That's what it was. Suplex. Yeah, yeah, that's what. Uh, I yeah, I very rarely had anybody take that right, and they'd hurt their knees or their face or whatever, and yeah, and uh, another reason I stopped doing it is because I thought it was like so much bigger than the um the pedigree and so i thought that out of respect you know i don't want to say hey here's an extreme version of the pedigree yeah that's how i felt yeah no, that's, that's pretty good hey we almost got 100 people here live in the chat guys thanks for joining us if you guys want a question asked be sure to use that super chat um chime on in and hey if you guys haven't already while you're tuning in please hit the like button uh, that helps out with the algorithm. Uh, be sure to admit, leave a comment too, and uh, hit that little bell, that subscribe button, so we can get to, get more word out about the pod and the show, and when we go live and all that malarkey. So. Yep. I'm also. Uh, by the way, I got the doors open today because you said it was freezing there, right? Dang it! You're rubbing it in. Yeah, 70 degrees here. Dang it! It's like 24 here, Rob. I was <laughs> in a wind chill of like 18 degrees. It's awful. Yeah, it's Dang pretty it, nice. Pittsburgh. Pretty nice out here. Yeah. Well, hey, guys, we have uh, some sponsors this week. Uh, This week's episode is sponsored by Blue Chew. Let's talk about sex. Guys, remember the days when you were always ready to go? Now you can increase your performance and get that extra confidence in bed. Listen up, BlueChew.com. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in a chewable tablet and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night. So you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. The process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of the licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you receive your prescription within days. The best part? It's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. BlueChew tablets are made in the U.S. of A. and pre- prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package. Oh, you could be missing out on the best sex of your life. So Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. And we've got a special deal for listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code RVD at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. Promo code RVD to receive your free first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. Wow. So, hey, baby. Yeah. Sounds like Blue Chew needs us to round the ladies up and do a commercial for them. Oh. I think that's a good move. <laughs> yeah. We'll get you thrown off a of Twitch. <laughs> there we go. Oh, mm. Well, uh, kind of a neat aspect about that triple tag match coming up, Rob, is you're back in the ring with Samoa Joe. And I happened to, uh, right before we started recording, I went back and watched your first ever match with Samoa Joe. It was on Impact. And it was July 8th, 2010. Um, wow. Yes. And you, it was a non-title match. You were the world champ at the time, but it was a non-title oh. match. You guys went probably about, I think, probably about 20 minutes or so. And you guys had immediate chemistry. Like, you started off, and you two mm. were just slugging it out hardcore. And... uh some really cool spots that you guys delivered. Uh, the finish actually ended up being um, you pulled the trick from Bret Hart, WrestleMania eight, where Samoa Joe had you in the sleeper hold and you used the turnbuckle to flip over and flip get the one, two, three on him. So and it works. Cool. Pretty good finish. Pretty good. Cool. Finish. Cool, man. Yeah. When you've been doing it as long as me, it's hard to find a trick that you haven't pulled out at least once or twice. <laughs> yep. Exactly. <laughs> 
But two, another added aspect was uh, people in the crowd. Uh, there were some old ECW guys that showed up. Raven. Rhino, Dreamer, yep. Stevie, you look at Raven. Raven. The Raven's back. That's Raven's back. Yep, <laughs> that's him. All right. So, Damn, all right. Do you have any memories of that? Does that charge up any memories at all, Rob? No, but I, 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 I guess it must have been a, a build up for when we brought back the uh, ECW um, on on TNA, which was awesome. I, I enjoy. Hey, happy 420, by the way. So we just texted Ooh. me. But I'll tell him uh, next week's better, I think. Yeah, that's totally fine. We can yeah, we'll um, get for him. He texted me at 420. I'm going to give him a happy 420. He won't understand it if it says 421. I better do it now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was cool. You know, having ECW come back is a reunion, and, and they changed the – I guess it was hard – hard justice i guess before so they changed it to hardcore, hardcore justice. justice yeah mm -hmm. i thought that was really cool i i guess they did that twice though huh because i wrestled sabu once but then i also wrestled jerry lynn in that metal mayhem match were those I both think, ecw reunion shows i think so i think they did they kept hardcore justice around for a little bit oh okay so yeah anyway fun time period you know i always loved ecw i love the hardcore element extreme rules ladder match whatever it takes to throw the rule book out and use my imagination and and durability to my advantage so um that's you know i think about that's awesome and, and it validates all of our efforts and time in ecw by giving us the stage to showcase it again i mean that was awesome that's TNA, those Dixie Carter like stepping aside, saying, "Here, you know, we got this platform. Go ahead, you got, you know, have your reunion." And and that's what that's what it felt like. So, still stoked to think about it. It's pretty neat too. And even during that match, there was some ECW chance going on, as you can imagine. Of course. Was, yeah. Yeah. Which, which, that match you just showed? Yeah, the one match I just talked about, you and Samoa Joe. Mm -hmm. Oh well, yeah. Well, there must have been because I'll tell you why because. Uh, uh, Rhino, Raven, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Tommy Dreamer, and Steve Richards were in the crowd. Yeah, that 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 uh, was definitely the reason I think. <laughs> pretty sure. Yep, pretty sure. Hey, we have a. Super yeah, but anyway, yes, yeah, Mojo's awesome. By the way, yep. you know, and uh, it doesn't seem like that long ago to to me having that match. So when you met, put the year in like that, then it makes sense. Then it's like, wow, okay, so I guess fourteen years ago, that's that's a pretty big chunk of time. You only get so many 14 month blocks of time in your life yeah and you know what it's kind of weird to think that at that time you were the tna champion you beat samoa joe and now he's the AEW world champion you're in a, and you're in a match with them so the tables have have turned so to speak so pretty cool you yeah. guys are on the opposite side of the ring again fuck yeah and uh that's cool yeah like you put it that way because like what i haven't paid my dues i don't deserve to be up there in the main event with the heavyweight champion are you kidding me i'm not bigger than this company bro don't make him go vince russo on you bro bro <laughs> don't make it happen <laughs> Looking so forward to it. it's a good it's a good, good match coming up uh yeah. it'll be neat to see you and joe mix it up again and hey year of rvd potentially happening here we got who's the same? Right. i might i might even get um hangman page back for giving me that dirty look when he walked by me after a, after a match Ooh. i don't know if the camera got it or not i don't think it did but after my match with swerve uh i started to walk up the ramp and then boom the light came on hangman's coming starts coming down and i went fuck and so I went back down the ramp and I just went around the corner to stand off to give him the, the space that he needed. And I just had my hands on my hips. You know, I was bummed that the referee counted three with RVD's shoulders. What rhymes with E? That sound, sounds like canvas or mat. Nothing. Nothing. Anyway, um, anyway, uh, you know, I was still like, you know, like bummed that, that that I didn't win the match and, and he walked by and he stopped to like, give me this look, this dirty look, like, like RVD, you lost. 
that's not what I told you to do. <laughs> that's what his eyes said to me. And I keep seeing that look in my head. And I'm just thinking, I just might get him back, even though he's my partner on Wednesday. You know, I'm not saying I'm going to leave him hanging and not, not tag in when he's in trouble, but I'm not saying I'm not either. You know, you can get him a bit of an education, I think. Uh, when he's I might find him. a way. I might find it. Hey, it might uh, it may just, universe might just fit something in there. You know, I understood the assignment. I nailed it. I crushed it. And yeah. he was only one count away from, he was only one count away from the match continuing anyway. Mm-hmm. That's it. And he was a split second away from the five star with a chair on top. So that's mm-hmm. it. <laughs> yeah, hey, did you see that too on so, uh, social media? Somebody was like, uh, "You should steal uh, Prince Nana's weed." Coming up, apparently. I don't. I mean, I saw a bunch of that the the the, the first time, like when when the match was announced or or that night or whatever, and I didn't understand it. And I at first. I actually wrote what's a Nana or, or something. Cause I, I didn't know, you know, yeah. like, and I still don't know what they were talking about. Like a site, it seemed like, I mean, I saw enough messages to where I thought there was an actual story, some bullshit that didn't happen, but they might've just been joking. I don't know, but I saw like a few questions and responses that, that made it th- seem like someone had said that I stole his weed or, or whatever. But anyway, but I know that dude. I just, I, I guess I didn't know his working name. Didn't put it together at that moment or whatever. But um, anyway, um, you know, what if I did smoke with him? Yeah. Who's to say you won't? Who's to say you won't? Oh. Who's to say I didn't is what I'm saying. Oh. Hmm. How about that? Hey, we Who do said- have a super chat. Boom. Super chat coming up. Super chat. Where's it at? Super chat. Gotta pull it up. Okay, here we go. Corey Donovan. Thanks for the ten dollars. He says, "Will you be at Big Business in Boston or a meet and greet? You're my top five favorites of all time. Last time I saw you was Money in the Bank in Boston. Amazing performance. You still look great. So there you go." Wow, well, uh, thank you, you for big that. Big business in Boston. That's an AEW event coming up. Oh, is it? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, at this time, I don't know if I'm on that. So, okay. can't confirm. Doesn't mean that I won't be there. Um, I'm not booked at this moment on that, but a lot of these bookings happen two days before they happen. Um, and I don't know if it's because guys are injured or, um, or what, or if it's listening to the fans or just who knows, either way, I'm glad to be in the opportunity that I'm in, you know, to just be on standby and like when I'm able to make it, um, then it's awesome. And it gets a lot of excitement going. Um, and, uh, shit, I'm inspiring the hell out of people that, they thought your body falls apart at 30 too. So that's uh that's a pretty cool position to accept as far as like, if I'm going to, you know, I won't always ask what's your legacy, you know, as far as leaving something behind now, if you asked me a year ago, I wouldn't even thought of that. You know, every time someone says, what's your legacy you're going to leave behind. You know, I always say, if I understand that question, right. I hope that people learn to be themselves and not worry about having to fit in with others whose values don't match yours and and don't worry about questioning, you know, what's wrong with me? How come I'm not into that same shit? And I think it's stupid that those guys are into because that's how I am with 99% of things people are into. But anyway, now I think that's all changed. I mean, just from the feedback, what I stand for right now, at least temporarily in the in in a lot of people's minds that have mentioned my name in the last two weeks, they think of, holy shit, 53, healthy as fuck. And um, I knew that, you know, but if, but to, to, to inspire people and impress upon them uh, a positive thing like that, that also hopefully gives them hope for, the, for themselves. Certainly gives me hope for them that they'll look at their lives a little different if they, um, felt a lot more limited than they should. So now I, I think that's probably going to be part of my legacy. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, you just the fact, the simple fact that you have the foundation of uh, stretching and, and putting that into your making that such a huge aspect of your wrestling acumen. And then later on coming up and then just like showing that you're very still capable of doing everything that you're still able to do. You still look great and everything like that. It just kind of further sets the bar for a lot of those other uh, veteran wrestlers or people that want to keep that longevity in the business. So. And, yeah, and that's, no, that's true. See, if I go after the uh, AEW championship, say I say I collect that fucking gold and add that and become the only wrestler to have held the WWE, TNA, ECW, and AEW championship. I mean, I do shit like that. I'm always finding new ways to stand out and be one of a kind. Imagine if that happened how inspired people would be in general to think they grew up watching me decades ago. And then here at 53, they're seeing me prospectively maybe having the best matches or the best year uh, of, of my career. Um, even if they could just look at it that way from, from a small point of view, you know, it's that, that's just amazing. That is. And you know what? Hey, no better time to uh, have that maybe potential title match happen is at the 420 Collision. You got announced for that coming up, the AEW Colli on the AEW Collision, 420. Yeah, what a better time to go up against maybe Samoa Joe if he's still the world champ at that point or somebody else. Who knows? And, and the Collision is the weekly show that's on Saturday. Saturday. Okay. On yeah. Saturday. Yep. Yeah. Um, they must have something in mind to have booked me this far ahead of time for that very special date. But uh, I, I've been booked and unbooked several times uh, already the, in the last like three months for that. Um, and so it's like, uh, you know, um, I am available. That just got canceled again. <laughs> so uh, cool. Looking forward to it, you know. Yeah, and by the way, as far as it's not hard to find what perspective personally what angle to take to look at this as being the best year. I mean, there's always the perspective of business of what it's like for me uh, being compensated for my time and controlling my own schedule. And uh, there's, those are things I, that, although I don't talk uh, in detail about as much are obviously the most important when it comes to me handling my own business. So, you know, like, uh, th 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 there's always that, you know, I mean, let's just say I did a lot, a lot of matches in WWE, uh, to, to make up for, um, a, a much smaller number of matches now. And I mean, I, I don't know how detailed, I mean, I, I think I even like said something recently open about it, but, but anyway, you just, you just, you just wouldn't, wouldn't believe it. And if you knew, then you would think right now, I'm definitely living in my best life. If you, if you compared say 66 matches to five matches, let's say from actual history. Yeah. And then you would say, holy shit, like, that's really hard to believe. But I'm just telling you that, uh, man, I really like being an independent contractor. And um, I'm happy with all the choices that got me here where I'm at right now. So um, if I can inspire other people to live the best lives they can, then fuck yeah, I'm all about it. Heck yeah, dude. And like, even last week, you gave advice on how to like that what your diet is and how your workout regimen and then on top of it we get the rvdology at the end of every go too so it's just like boom if you guys want this kind of stuff rob has it for you right here that's it that's it man that's it hey we got another super chat Ooh, another super chat it is let's see oh my gosh i'm trying to pull up seamless transition here uh comments there it is all right <laughs> there it is wait that's not it either a dp 1997 thank you for the 9.99 pounds rob are you in wd 2k24 if so i'll pre-order it right now man i get asked that question a lot and i don't know there we go which is 
Common. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, you're going to make me, you know, I can't turn my back on synchronicity because this is how the universe communicates with me. All right. The 66 matches I was talking about was my return to WWE in 2013. Mm -hmm. I did 66 matches in uh, 90 days. I had a three month contract, 66 matches. And I knew what my guarantee was. Was I going to beat my guarantee? I mean, that's a lot of matches. You would think that the guarantee would be low enough, but it was so questionable. Every day before the show, when people are working out in the ring, I'd go up to Mark Carano. <laughs> and, I, and I'd be like, dude, uh, what's up, man? Is it, uh, you know, um, am I going to be able, am I going to break the guarantee? Because, you know, just being there anyway, what it depended on was, was I going to be in WK215? or whatever yeah. the fuck they called it mm -hmm. that year's video game. And Mark Carano would tell me that every day, he'd be like, you know what? I, I, you, you joined, um, you said you joined right after they cast everybody for the game, but I don't think it was too late. I, I think they might've added John, but I'm not sure. And he would say, I, I, let me find out. And so I would keep checking with him every day, you know, and that, that was what was going to depend on if I beat my guarantee or not was if I'm in the video game, I'm going to beat my guarantee. If not, it's going to be right about neck and neck, which means if I got injured and stayed home for the three months, I would have got paid the same as I got paid for the 66 matches. And I'm telling you right now that if you can imagine if that was what I was getting paid for five matches now, then you would imagine I would have a pretty happy mindset now, not wishing that I was back in the day. Um, and that's a lot to take in. And I know life is amazing, but you work for peanuts because you work so much that it all adds up in the end. So I, I signed a year deal for uh, before a year at a time, mm -hmm. three year deals, and anyway, if, if you know, if you like, I, I said last week, I talked about they gave me 500 bucks when I first went there and worked at Johnny, Johnny Stamboli, Johnny the Bull in Atlanta. And I got 500 bucks and I was like, I can't, I can't. That's when Pat Patterson had a talk with me in Mellon Arena. You're going to make a lot of money here, kid. And I, it's like, dude, like I said, at a zero on that, I was making that before I got here. And, and, now I'm in WWE in front of these huge crowds and you're going to pay me that. And um, the thing is one, the money does come up and the bigger star you are and the more they decide to pay you. But also the other fact is if you're working 250 days in a year, then even that 500 ends up being 125 grand, you know, at that, at that pay, You'd work your ass off for that 125 grand. And then, you know, when it comes to hotel pay and shit, they're sketchy about that. And uh, anyway, that's all part of the, uh, of the, of the J-O-B. But they, Mark Colonel kept saying, I think you're in, I think you're in it. And then, uh, no, I guess you didn't, you're not in this year's video game. I don't know until it comes out. And so I wasn't in that game. And so what I made for those 66 matches was the same that I could have made for staying home if I was, if I was injured, like in 2015, uh, when I injured my knee, was that 15? No, I'm sorry. 2005. I saw the five, but, um, when I injured my knee and I was off for 12 months, one of my favorite years of my whole career. And that's because I made my guarantee, which I would have made working, um, Jesus, I don't know, 300 days uh, that year? Yeah, right. right. But anyway, as an independent contractor, you know, I can, there's, you know, with WWE, when you get booked, when I say you, that's generally speaking, but a lot of, of us, when we get booked, it's not about the payday. Whereas 
usually it is that's how we make our living you know you want me to come and wrestle for you you know th this is what i need but if wwe says uh hey are you able to come in and announce the fucking draft picks or whatever you know for me it's not like okay well let's start negotiating okay here's what i need because it's not that big of a deal where i, I mean they could probably just replace me with someone and say okay never mind because they already have a budget figured out whatever they're gonna pay you if they pay you and it's you know it just it, it's not even about that with them normally mm -hmm. although it would be it would be unfortunately it wasn't for me when they had me come back to my first royal rumble after i left way back in 2007 when i did that following royal rumble that's exactly how i felt when they wanted me to come back i did this big surprise and for me it was like you know it's not really about the money here so i didn't stick it to them but i should have because it was a really big appearance uh and because they would have paid because when i left our pay-per-views were really decent you know paydays and they were almost every month pretty much and um and, and instead my ego took over and i was like i'm gonna show johnny that i'm not hungry out here without him you know what i mean yeah stupid. yeah stupid when i look back at it you know, I, I definitely could have got three times, four times what I got, but I wanted to show, you know, like, yeah, I can do that. Sure. No problem. And um, later on, you know, when I get booked, it's just about that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. so, so now it's a lot different, but, um, but WWE uh, pays you, or at least they used to, I guess it's different now. And I hear the guarantees are much higher now and they're restructured completely different, but it used to be, you know, like if you looked at the guarantee of what you'd get at the end of the year, I'm going to at least get that no matter what. And then, you know, um, that's, that's how a lot of times you get kicked in the balls along the way on live events, especially when they're doing A, B and C shows because they're drawing smaller crowds. They're split up too much. And that's why they stopped doing that, you know, but, um, but yeah, and I didn't know when I first got there that sometimes the checks would be much bigger. So uh, that's, I didn't, that was something I didn't feel like I had much control over. I had some control. I say I like being an independent contractor, but it really depended on how much balls I had. I could have at any time gone to the office and complained or suggested we'd make some changes or whatever. They're all, they always would have been open to that. I'm not saying I wouldn't have got heat for it, or that a lot of other wrestlers would have gotten a lot more heat than I would have for it, you know, um, but that doesn't make it an employee employer situation in my mind. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And to your point about like the, the video game, I think Kev Nash was just asked that about the same thing. Is he going to be in 2k 24 how many outfits or something? He's like, it's like, I have no idea. <laughs> he had no idea either. So it's, it's an ongoing thing kind of thing. And uh, yeah. Whoa. 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 Rob, we already have another super chat. Boom. Super hey. chat. Another super chat. Where is it at? <laughs> Tommy Dreamer is now the head of TNA Creative. Is that a fact? That is not a fact. Here, we'll get to oh. the super chat in a second. Here, so, okay. So that initially got reported. Dave Meltzer reported that in the latest Observer newsletter. But then Tommy okay. Dreamer himself on Busted Open Radio, radio actually okay. has his quote. Debunked has, it. He debunked it. He says, oof. Okay. I'm so glad people know things about my life that I don't know. He's like, thanks for the promotion. He's like, I hope I get a raise with this fictitious position. Because if I was head of creative, you know, Moose is losing the TNA world title to me at whatever next show is. And he's just said, it's the same deal as always before. It really and truly is. Nothing has changed within the creative process. Thank you very much. So, um, did you have that prepared? You were going to say that or something? Yeah, I was going to mention that. Okay. And, um, did he say if he's if he's create had a creative that Moose is gonna lose the championship? Yeah, that's what he said. He's that's like funny. Moose will lose the title to me set coming up the next paper. That's funny. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, I, I did want to ask you just to Was that the super chat? No, that wasn't the super okay. chat. I'll hit the super chat. Because I just picked a random one and uh <laughs> so I didn't know if the super chat matched it or not. You know? No, no, he's got a uh let me see. Okay, I'll, I'll ask that one. This is that'll actually be a good segue into what I'm. Gonna, so, how do you think Tommy would be though as a head of creative? Like, he's got a great mind for the business. So, it's yeah, I, I think that he would be great at it um, because 
he's office material, you know, some of the guys, some of the guys might surprise you, you know, they, they aren't normally office, but really understand the business well and, and have a good brain for it. They could do well, but someone like Tommy, he's got experience like in the office, helping set up programs, book shows, everything. You know what I mean? Like from handling the merchandise, uh, he, he knows what he's doing. I, I'm not saying that his work wouldn't be critiqued and I'm not saying that I wouldn't critique it. I'm not saying he would, that he wouldn't come up with some silly shit that would make me roll my eyes. Uh, but at the same time, he would, he would do a lot of good as well. Yeah. Like, you know, there's a, there's all those aspects, like everybody's got their own creative, like you look, think about Triple H heading creative right now. And then, you know, Shawn Michaels, who we're going to mention here in a second piece creative down in uh, NXT kind of aspect. And then there's just a lot of good minds going, but it, not everybody's going to hit every time, you know, too. There's going to be something that everybody has some differences with and so forth. But uh, Tommy overall just knows what the hell he's doing. So um, he's, he's like one of those good foundation people that you could have in that kind of position. Yeah, he, he cares about that side of the business and always has. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, so the super chat here. Ice T he he. Thank you for the ten dollars. <laughs> he says, "Okay, so he mentions you and Shawn Michaels. Uh, you guys have also put on both your best matches at the at the late, later parts of your career. Uh, Shawn was ten years younger than Rob is now. How about that? So when Shawn Michaels came back and did all that wrestling and stuff like that, and kind of had that renaissance, he was ten years younger than you, Rob. So he was like in his young forties, and they were treating him like he was old. Yeah, right." Wow, man, times are changing, mm -hmm. you know, like I keep hearing, you know, like 70s, the new 50, 50s, the new 30. And um, you, you could take that as if like, oh, that's just what people say when they're older so that they feel younger. But really, um, I, I expect there's going to be some major announcements in the future years about how we're living too long probably and it's probably going to be a problem that uh because expectations you know always go up as our uh our education on nutrition and health and medicine you know antibiotics everything just the the more advanced we get the longer we're able to extend our life and now we're able to like clone body parts and shit when we need them so um it's when it comes to all that People sometimes think like you're crossing the line and playing God, you know, when you genetically create your baby and decide what color eyes and hair and all this stuff ahead of time. And that, some of that stuff gets weird, but just the fact that we have the ability to do that, um, it has a spillover effect, you know, we're just the average person with the average life if they're not living out in the middle of the jungle of the jungle or the desert but they well hey we're in the middle of the desert but but if they're surrounded by society like we are man their living conditions are going to offer a uh um uh, a continuously extended duration yeah yeah it's the times we are living in so the question he does ask though uh, and i think you answered this before rob uh, do you think you'll ever transition into booking? Into do I think I will into booking? Yeah, you. I don't think I will. I don't think I will. You know, um, but whereas maybe I used to say never, now I'm like, I don't. I don't know. It's not. I don't think it's something that interests me. But then it might be something that I have a, a skill that could come in useful at some point maybe but i don't i don't plan on it i don't foresee that happening but i do know that uh i've got a lot of experience a lot of life and a lot of things that were on the table in front of me but not necessarily right in front at my place a lot of that stuff has circled around throughout the years and stuff that used to be background interest found its way into my life where now it's important that I paid half-ass attention to that stuff because now it's, it's relevant and, and that happens and I'm going to be alive for a long, long time. So there's no telling uh, what, what kind of occupation and positions I'll come across. 
pick and like some of the stuff you've mentioned on here whether it's like a hypothetical or certain aspects that you've got from like the chic or sabu and stuff like that you'd be i think you'd be an excellent part of like the creative team of giving some input and seeing where where things could kind of go and stuff like that too so Raymond. yep hey another super chat another super chat Boom, but i will say you know like i've always looked at that position as like a suit and tie kind of position and yeah. like uh yeah, and I always look at that as like former wrestlers that wish they could still wrestle but can't do it anymore. And um, and so the young guys feel like those agents or bookers are above them, like they're in a position higher, like a superior. And I never have because I got the same ring time and I can still do it. So I look at it more like... I don't have to look up to you because I can beat your ass. <laughs> FYI. <laughs> so, but, um, you know, I don't know. Um, maybe, but it's, I have mentioned that before. I used to look at that as like a stooge position, but my perspective is changing. You know, like I'm always saying it's so silly. I got brought in thinking people that try to get ahead by talking to the writers or suggesting ideas or whatever, you know, in the, in the locker room mentality, in the, the hoods that I associated with those guys, you know, were ass kissers and uh, stooges. You don't trust them. And they're, you know, office people. It just, it's, it's, it's part of the silly sporty part of being dumb jocks, I guess, you know, because looking at it as a job, in the corporate world, like if you got ideas to tell the boss that could advance you, why, why wouldn't you tell them? Yeah. yeah. But, but you know, it, it's taken um, this whole lifetime for me to arrive where I'm at now and be able to look at it from a bigger picture. And, uh, and those, those same morals though are still inside me of being that, uh, being one of the hoods that, that opposes the, the suit and ties or, or the, the stooges or, or, or whatever, you know, there's certain things like Bob Holly's always going to be Bob Holly. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and I have that inside of me. I just, I, as, as an effort of reprogramming myself, like I'm always talking about doing, I'm able to have a, a much wider and more accurate perspective of everything. Right. Right. Yeah. You learn as you go kind of thing. Yeah. Super chat. A new one. We have Corey Donovan. Thank you for the five dollars. If you had to rank your runs by the company, number one being your favorite, what company did you have the most fun in? WWE, TNA, or ECW? So if you had to rank those one to three, where were you having the most fun? I think I know what number one is. Yeah, it's it's definitely uh, ECW. You know, you gave me the standard to use there and made it easy. If somebody asks me to use my own standards and, and choose which was my favorites in what order, then I have to uh, set the standards. The most fun was ECW. Biggest money was WWE. And uh, when I went to TNA, that was the uh, the easiest. You know, it was uh, uh, my, my annual guarantee there was... Uh, pretty much the same as WWE, but I only had to work like two days every two weeks as opposed to five days a week or whatever. So um, that that's that's how it goes. You know, I had the most fun uh, partly and mostly because of the awesome style, but also because of where I was in my career and that point in life, you know. And so, you know, that the, the young years when you're, still finding out who you are and still making a name for yourself. Um, those, those are really fun, but I wouldn't want to repeat them. Right. Right. So you, if you were to rank them all by fun, it would be number one, ECW, number two, maybe TNA, and then number three, WWE or. Uh, hmm, I would probably put EC. I'm sorry. I would probably switch WWE and, and, and TNA around because, uh, just because it was easy doesn't necessarily mean it was fun. And WWE had a lot of stressful parts to it. You know, a lot of uh, really um, um, 
monotonous parts to it and and some of it was very very challenging but the fun parts were also like really really fun and the opportunities and places i've been and things i've seen and stuff like that where so like with impact uh it was, uh, you know, it, it was it was fairly easy. It was cool that we're still on TV and they were trying to build themselves up and it was cool to be part of that and stuff. But I didn't enjoy um, as much working with younger talent that, in my mind, were already dry cement. Mm-hmm. so you didn't think they had like more upward ceiling kind of thing at that certain aspects i feel like overall i i felt like the vibe was that a lot of them felt like they were already there and felt like they oh, were they should, be, okay. they should be competition with uh, rvd boom we should go 30 minutes neck and neck or i should win yeah i was i felt like the whole thing was like you know like who are these kids? You know what I mean? And it was, and not, not a hundred percent, but overall I felt like that more. And like I said, even back then they weren't talking to me, the office, you know what I mean? Like it wasn't, they, they let me do my own thing and, and felt, I think they felt like they'd be insulting me if they, if they told me anything, you know, if they, if they even said, I mean, they would tell me good things. Like I remember Dio telling me he really appreciated that I was. I took a lot of time and worked with um, Zion. Um, oh yeah, Z my on. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and he always tells me that too. That I'm one of the guys that really helped him in his career learn a lot because I took time with him. I enjoyed working with him, and they would tell Dio told me about like that, but they, but not about like what they wanted from me or anything. And um, yeah, anyway, I don't think that I would think of i guess most of the fun of tna was just walking around universal studios (laughs) (laughs) check it all that out (laughs) for the most part yeah Corey donovan with another super chat thank you again for the five dollars he said rob have you ever talked with tony khan about being more consistent on AEW and having a set schedule 20 dates a year or something in that aspect um you kind of like the with the situation you're at now, but uh, I knew you mentioned too before that you weren't necessarily against maybe having a more schedule with AEW. But what are, what are your thoughts on that overall now, Rob? Um, so I have not had the discussion with Tony Khan uh, when I first talked to him about coming in, and this was this was a long time ago because um, it would have been. Well, they were doing a show in or near Battle Creek in Michigan, but I ended up not coming in for that one. That was at least two years ago. I can't remember the date right now, so I don't want to get it wrong because I'm not known for putting false facts out there. Yeah. If I do, I try to correct myself in the comments. Yeah. I called dude out here, Buffalo Bill, instead of Buffalo Jim. I apologize to Buffalo <laughs> Bill. Okay. Yeah. Wrestling. Wrestling promoter slash mechanic slash mafia thorn in the ass. Uh, anyway, um, I haven't had to talk with him, but way back then he was talking about, I think that'd be a great way to, to bring you in, you know, in Battle Creek. And I was like, yeah, cool. Uh, and then he was talking about, or no, I, you know what? I checked with WWE and, and at the time, um, I said, I think my deal is just merchandise. Mm -hmm. Lord knows you guys aren't fucking calling me, are you? And uh, I didn't say that, but I was thinking. And anyway, they checked, they came back and said, "Uh, you're right. Uh, Our deal is just merchandise, so you can wrestle for AEW. And then um, I said, cool. And then I talked to Tony, and I was telling, giving him an idea of how I felt about my merchandise deal there. You know, because it was worth bringing up. That's what I have to lose. You know what I mean? That's my deal with them. I have that. Uh, if they're going to be jerks or whatever, or decide they don't want to promote me, because whatever. Um, at that time, he talked about he had a few guys that were injured, 
and he thought maybe it'd be cool to just you know bring me in when i'm able to to work uh, help him out like nice i heard or whatever and i said uh, that sounds cool and then boom didn't hear anything from them again for ever four or five months maybe six months and it just didn't happen and then i was just like okay whatever i don't know wwe did the same thing they called checked on some dates and then just boom you know like whatever part of the job you know i don't i don't mark it on the calendar until i know and i know because i'm holding on to something in my hand um and anyway uh finally it was uh jungle boy that reached out to me and said you know that he'd been talking about doing this program boom 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 and that was many months later and i think everyone knows the history since then yeah how about that and then the wheels started turning there so sweet yeah. um rob did you happen to see the rock uh turn heel more more heel on smackdown this week no i almost clicked on it uh but for for whatever reason i, I chose something else i'll probably watch it later it was very entertaining rob um he came back in his like 500 hundred dollar shirt as you can see there and I'm like just was classic attitude era rock basically they were in salt lake city so he was trashing mormons and their inbred grand grand yeah. like nice. doing all this classic rock stuff and it was yeah. it was pretty fun to see so <laughs> now do you think that could hurt his movie sales if like really ignorant fans are like well he's a jerk now i don't like him no more yeah i don't know i i don't think so because it's like right now too i don't know if he's in any really big productions at the moment so by the time you know wrestlemania rolls over and everything like that it kind of maybe all wash away at this point so i don't think it might affect him too much in that regard i was thinking that too honestly though but I don't think it will. Um, what else was I going to say about that, though? Dang it, I can't remember. But, um, yeah, uh, Blue Meanie actually had an interesting theory that The Rock is healing it up in front of Roman Reigns because he's going to pull a fast one on Roman Reigns. He doesn't like what Roman Reigns has done to the bloodline, to his Samoan legacy and stuff like that, his family legacy. He's going to pull a fast one on him, help Cody out. So kind of interesting there's been some context clues perhaps that indicate that too so it's pretty interesting to kind of think about but yeah there's need to see the rock back so yeah you'll have to check that out at some point yeah yeah i'll check it out yeah i uh, like the little the little thing he did on uh, is it pat mcafee is that yeah the, the cody crybaby stuff yeah i popped yeah. that and i was like i loved it and i keep saying that with someone asked how do i feel i'm like i agree cody crybaby <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I've explained that on here last week, I think. Oh, right? yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah. He mentions that, though, too, uh, in the promo on, on SmackDown. <laughs> about, like you, He's like, you had Roman Reigns in the Rock at WrestleMania. You had it, and you let it go. And he's <laughs> like, he's like, you flush it down the toilet, just like you do when you sit down there and you're texting, oh, Cody's got to win. Cody's got to win. It's funny shit. We want to hear his story. Yeah, right. that's what he was saying. Cody's got to finish his story. It's very yeah. funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome yeah yeah it was good shit man so oh what else do i want to talk to you about oh yeah we talked about this a couple weeks ago too with cm punk he got hurt and then he uh, actually talked about uh getting hurt and then um the process to that so he's like so this was in an interview for ufc last night i think yeah i can't remember the the network he's on fight network or something like that but he says i'm like I'm like an old car. I'm like a 72 Nova. You know what I mean? We have to, we have to change some parts every now and again. So who said this? CM Punk. This is CM okay. Punk. Oh, so, okay. he, so he tore his right triceps. I think that right now, and then a couple years ago, he tore his left tricep. Might be the other way around, but either way, he's like, so once we fix up all the parts, the engine is still strong. We'll still be good to go. We're thinking maybe six to eight months for his time of recovery, but I'm not really in a rush to get back to compete. He's more so concerned about just getting healthy. But it made me think about what you were saying, like, you know, how there's that impression, like, oh, he's fragile or whatever. And that's not necessarily the case. It just might be wear and tear on the body, maybe not wrestling for a long time. And, you know, once he gets back to it, you know, he could be good to go. So. And there's always just the, the, just the chance. There's always just a chance that anything is going to fuck you up. You know, I, I mentioned um, I – broke my ankle the first time i remember getting hurt 
Well, actually, the first time I broke my foot, I forgot about this time, but it was just a hairline fracture. Um, it was just my base foot on the ground while I did a high uh, side kick. I kicked Pistol Pez Watley at a house show, and my, my foot on the ground, it slipped on like some spilled beer or something. When it did, just the way my foot flexed, it gave mm -hmm. me a hairline fracture. And um, But with that, I just felt like, okay, I'll shake it off in a few weeks. When I broke my ankle in my match with Rhino in ECW, it was just a baseball slide, the simplest move, but my late, my, my one underneath foot somehow caught the canvas and rolled underneath my weight and momentum and it snapped my, uh, and it broke. And then there's so many people that told me they've done the exact same break from doing the exact same move. And so, you know, it is a very, physical job and there's always a good chance that um anything could end up just going half an inch this way or half an inch that way and making the difference of uh, being hurt and by the way can you imagine if you are so 200 matches a year can you imagine all it takes is getting hurt probably two times out of 200 matches and you'd be labeled fragile that's the kind of pressure we have on us Right. There's all these expectations. And it's like when you talk about the video games and the fans play the video games all the time or they have they buy the action figures or whatever. They get hurt and get right back up, right? Yeah, they hurt get right back up. That's not how wrestling actually works. All these people are you guys are putting your bodies on the line and everything like that. Yeah, we really are superheroes though. And it really is for the super tough. You know, yeah. I don't think any I don't think anybody tries to discount that unless they get into it and have one or two days of working out in the ring and then realize it's not for them. Yeah. And it's, it's sometimes it's a matter of like ignorance and that's in the literal sense is like, um, you think about some of these pro athletes that, that come into it and they're like, Oh, I can do this. This is going to be easy. And it's not easy. <laughs> it looks fun. I guess. I guess that's yeah. why I wanted to do it. It just looks so fun. But also I thought I was tough as a kid too. Maybe not before I started watching wrestling, though. I think wrestling brought that out of me. It, oh, you, so you think when you started tuning into wrestling and stuff like that, that kind of got you more to, like... I think maybe so. I don't... Uh. But, I mean, I was also into martial arts movies, you know, even before. And I would run up the trees and do backflips and try and imitate the moves I saw. So, um, maybe not. I just... I guess when I think back to it, I always felt like I could do some moves, but I wasn't like athletic and I wasn't, you know, like uh, fighting until after I was practicing all the wrestling moves and stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no doubt about yeah. that. All right. Hey, guys, just so you know, this uh, episode is also sponsored by Get Blitzed. Get Blitzed. It's a THC Lit Aid. Get Lit Aid. Nano infused THC syrup that is 100% legal in all 50 states. There's so many different flavors from pina colada to cherry to key lime pie. I know that's Kevin Nash's favorite. To, uh, there's a few more flavors too. It's uh, sponsored by Mickey Ray Sinatra and his wife Courtney. Uh, you can get 15% off now. Go to get blitz.com and use promo code RVD. Or if you're watching, there's a QR code that you can scan right there and get getblitz.com so yes 15 percent off promo code rvd check it out i can't wait to get my batch after my cat stole my first batch so i'm ready to rock and roll and try it out myself so <laughs> nice so. Yeah. <laughs> all right rob we'll close it out here with a couple other notes here somebody this now this is not a super chat but i thought this was a really interesting question i want to see where you weigh in on this uh baccarat natural says, would you rather have teamed with the Rock and Roll Express or the Midnight Express? <laughs> um, well, let's see. The uh, Midnight Express was Bobby Eaton and... Um, Stan Lane. Okay. Was, is that Stan Lane? Okay. Yeah. And then uh, the Rock and Roll Express. Is that Janetti and Michaels? No, no. Oh, that's uh, no. Ricky Morton and... Uh, Oh, right, right, yeah. I, that's that's what came up in my mind when you said it, and then I forgot already. Yeah. Ricky Martin. And uh, what's dude's name? The dark haired dude? Gibson. Yeah, Robert Gibson. Yep. I see those guys at every convention. <laughs> yeah, they're 
By the way, I was impressed to see Ricky wrestle last year at Starcade. He was like, yeah, he's in his sixties, right? And he was like still moving, and I was like, damn, man, he's still out there doing the arm drags and stuff. He's doing Canadian destroyers and shit too. I hate, um, that. I hate that move. I know I don't like it either. I really okay. don't. It's so weird looking. It doesn't look natural. <laughs> it just looks weird. It re- to me, it represents the whole new style. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is that's the one move you think of when it's like modern yeah. wrestling and what's kind when of when I think of the two guys working together to get the spot over, even though it doesn't look like even though they expose the business by actually doing the move, and I don't really know which guy's taking it or giving it. It's they both do both. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I hate it, but I know it gets good pops. You know, the car goes crazy. Mm-hmm. I'm not a fan either. <laughs> Well, would you? So, where would you think you'd line up for it? Rock and roll. Um, rock. I, I would go with the uh, Rock and Roll Express. Uh, I'd rather be with them just because um, I know those guys. We've uh, been at a lot of uh, venues together, um, whether it's wrestling or, or or autograph conventions or whatever. And um, man, Stan Lane and Bobby Eaton. Although I do have limited uh experience with both of the both of them i don't know them didn't know bobby a, a, as much and uh or stan is stan stan still alive right it's still alive yep mm-hmm. but bobby passed right bobby passed i want to say two years ago so when i think of bobby i mean i was in wcw at the same time as him and i had a match with uh i, I I feel like I might have had a match with him, but I've never yeah. seen it. Maybe that's a question for YouTube, Chris. Yeah, I'll have to get him I on. Feel like I did. I, like I just remember parts of yeah, huh? But anyway, I remember um, having the issue of having conflicting advice coming from the different veterans, you know. And Rip Rogers was saying that I waste my moves by doing too many out there and I should just do one kick at the end. That way it means a lot instead of doing all this flying kicks and spins and and um and I was like, man, that sucks. That's not what I want to do. And I remember asking Bobby and Bobby um I, I don't remember exactly what he said, but I liked him because he took my side and he was like, no, that that's your gimmick. That's your gimmick. No, go out there and do do you do your gimmick. He can't tell you how to do your own your gimmick, you know. And um, but I feel like that was when I was going to work Bobby, and I kind of remember him backdrop made me land on my feet. So I feel like that that might have happened. But if I've ever seen that match, it's only been once ever, and that would have been ninety three. So someone check that out. Yeah. Wow. I'm intrigued, Rob. I'm going to look it up. That'd be pretty darn nifty. Bobby, he's known as Stan the- Lane, by the way. Stan Lane, by the way, might as well spit this out because uh that's 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 what the podcast is. It's just me talking and telling stories. But I love it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I love the things that are ignited in my mind and then sharing them because nobody fucking knows this. Why would they? You know? Yeah. But so when I went to South Atlantic uh pro wrestling in ninety two, this is after uh whoa, wait a minute. 91. Sorry. Oh. Ding, ding, ding. Yes. This was after my USWA run had uh, dried up synchronously. We talked about this earlier when we don't have anything else for you. And then I went up um, and then um, I went, you know, I called Slinker who was down in Florida talking like he was going to open up and he's like, well, I'm not ready yet. He says, call my friend Manny Fernandez. He's opening up. He's got this thing in South Carolina. Boom. I went to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and I worked uh, South Atlantic Pro Wrestling for a very short amount of time. Super young. Like, these memories are baby memories. I can't believe it. It was, like, the first time I'd ever driven that far by myself from uh, Battle Creek down there to Charlotte, North Carolina. But um, some of the guys that were cool, um, like uh, Jeff Husker, uh, his name was Gino something, but Jeff Husker, Tommy Angel, these guys, I remember being in the car with them, riding around and stuff. And um, they were bragging about Stan Lane. I don't know who Stan was working for at the time. He wasn't working for South Atlantic, but he was already a bigger star 
bigger than all of us. And it was just cool that they knew him because he lived local. And for whatever reason, we were going over to stop by his apartment. And um, and we did. And on the way there, I just remember they kept telling me, uh, Stan is the king of sluts. He's the <laughs> king of sluts. That's what, it, that's what they kept telling me <laughs> over and over. <laughs> and uh, and so uh, we went there, might have had a drink or something, or maybe he ended up going with us to Plum Crazy. I think that's what happened. Um, but while we were there, um, I was 20 years old not even old enough to drink legally. Um, so I just remember like, wow, looking at his bachelor apartment and looking back at it, you know, it was, it, it, it was small. It wasn't, you know, like a huge mansion. It was, it might've been, you know, I don't know. It might've been 1200 square feet, might have been smaller, but what was really cool was all the furniture was like black leather and um and everything was was black and i just thought that looked so cool because i was just so young that you know the only thing i knew was how my mom decorated yes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so i just remember thinking like wow goals you know when i got my yeah. own place i'm gonna have like a black leather couch black bookshelves a black tv stand fuck yeah black carpet and and um uh, and I always just remember that. And I did like that. It inspired my first several things. And even now, like Katie loves black. So that's really cool. Cause, um, we often will choose that as a decor option, but that's, uh, my only Stan and Bobby Eaton story. I like it. You know, uh, did you hear the, the urban legend that he was, um, the like father of that Senator, I think, or whatever her name is, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Like there was that, <laughs> there was there was like a report going around that he could have been her father, like her legitimate father. That it ended up not being true, but it got around on the internet for a while. He was the king of sluts. <laughs> the king of sluts. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what a moniker that is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Hey, right, we got another super chat, and then we'll close it out here, Rob. Boom. It's again by Corey Donovan. Thank you again for the nine ninety nine. He said, when you made the jump to TNA and now to AEW, do people already there, like former friends slash colleagues, such as the Hardys and Jericho, Big Show, et cetera, influence your decision to go there? Did that kind of influence you there or intrigue you a little bit to go to AEW, Rob? Or? Hmm. That's a good question. I would have to say... <sighs> Not on the front, you know, as far as like <laughs> if Tony would have called me and wanted to do a range of booking, it's very likely if the terms were worked out that I would take that booking. But, <laughs> but you know, when I really searched my mind, uh, I'm sure they were an influence on my opinion of AEW because... Um, you know, there's some veterans, guys that are my age that are there. Um, and I appreciate that they get respect there. And um, and knowing that definitely made me a lot more optimistic about being there. Uh, I would love to work with Jericho, Christian, Edge, Big Show. That'd be awesome. You know what I mean? But um not just work with them, but just, yeah, just the fact that they're there because if I, if it was just a bunch of new young guys and I didn't know any of them and their goal was to say, screw traditional wrestling. We're here to say, screw the old way. This is the new way. Uh, I probably couldn't really get behind that that much because of my own old school fundamentals. You know what I mean? Like, and so when they first came out, I was like, okay, well, let's see if they're able to prove themselves. A lot of people come out really strong and say they're going to be the next thing. And then, uh, boom, right off the bat, they were drawing big crowds like out here. I don't know if this was their first show. It was one of them, I think, out here in Vegas at that Double or Nothing or whatever it was. There was a Starcade attached to it. And it was just so big and for, for not being WWE. And, and then it seemed like, 
boom, they're doing it. They're doing it. But then there was always still the young guys that I can tell haven't been to places that I've been, you know? Like I said before, when you go to WWE, young guys, they all get taught, whoa, slow down. You know, you're not selling anything. Make it mean something. And when I watch my pre-WWE stuff, I see that. But people that don't have the whole bigger picture might not prefer that. They might prefer it when the guy takes a pile driver, then stands up and turns around and feeds into a super kick takes a bump and stands up and turns around and feeds into a DDT and stands up and turns around and then feeds into a stone cold stunner for a one, two kick out. Personally, <laughs> that's not what I like about the business. I, I you know, I mean, that's uh, if that's credibility, then I don't understand the new translation of credibility. Um, then I think a lot of people are there with me as well. So I'm going to say, um, Ultimately, it was a factor. It was a factor in how I felt about it. It never got down to where I had to write all the pros and cons and and, and struggle over a decision because it was just a booking, just like any other booking. And and really, that, that would have been what it was all about. Um, although I felt a lot better about it and still do seeing uh, people like me and by the way when i was trying to describe tna and i was saying i feel like i felt like a lot of those guys hadn't been there but they felt like they were there enough already and felt i felt like a little to me i don't feel like i had earned enough respect in their eyes in order for them to feel like they were on my equal level and that made everything different. Talking to them, going over matches, everything. If that makes and sense. TNA. And TNA went out. If that makes sense. I like when people add that little quote to, to really <laughs> say, it made sense to me, but if you can hang with that motherfucker. <laughs> then you can. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, geez. We did get another super chat here. Thomas V, thank you for the initial 279. And here's your question. Thomas V, thank you for this 699 in Canadian dollars. You live your life to the best, the beat of your own drum. Any advice on how to stop caring about what others think of you and just do what makes you happy? Absolutely. That's fucking, dude, first off, uh, study RVDology. If you haven't seen that, if you go to my YouTube page at The Real RVD, there's a playlist called RVDology. And although it's been, uh, I've only done one in the last several months, I think about it all the time. I just, I think about all kinds of stuff that I don't do. That's why I know I'm going to be around for a long time. I got so much on my agenda, 10 years worth of projects. Um, but I'm not desperate to get any of them done. And that's a pro and a con. But uh, overall, it works for me. <laughs> When you, when you got something and you really, I got to get this done, man. I got to get this done. I got it turned in. I got to get paid for this. I don't know, how am I going to make rent? Boom, boom. I, I hate that desperate energy. And, you know, I talked before about when I left WWE, I was walking away from having gotten a check, a guaranteed check for years and years. And, and now, because I didn't even finish that story. Now, I love being independent so much it would feel somewhat controlling if I wasn't, you know, if I had a guaranteed uh, check and schedule and obligations, it would feel restricting in a way to where it would have to be worth it, you know, which of course it could be. But, um, but I wanted to add that on the end of it too. That, that, like I feel that. Um, so, you know, our radiology, I break down like all, all of my values and they're all, they all equal, they're all like amino acids that, that together make one big protein of nonconformity. And um, you have to reprogram yourself as an adult. If you haven't taken the time to do that and you still think Santa Claus is real, then that's what I suggest. What I did when I walked away from WWE, I, my spirit was sick. And right now, if I'm angry, my spirit is, is sick. A lot of people are angry all the time. For me, I need to adjust. I'm not healthy. When I could, it's like being ill. Like I could be, I could go to Katie and just be like, I'm angry. 
<laughs> you know, so as long as I'm angry, like I'm going to go off on somebody and that's how it feels, you know, like I feel, sometimes I'm like, I feel mm, confrontational. Like I, I don't want to be around people like this is dangerous. And a lot of people just work with that. I cannot, I can't have that energy be part of me. Um, and, and, and the, and the way that I control that is I put my spirit first. So you got body, mind, and spirit. It sounds cliche, but what I did was I really did some self-studying and I realized I had the mind, you know, and I'm always improving on learning stuff. I enjoy reading, whatever. I can uh, point my mind at things that I need to absorb. Uh, the body, okay, that's part of my lifestyle, always has been. I work out. I'm always learning better ways to increase my efforts to be healthier. But my spirit was sick. I was so burnt out on the monotonous uh, travel schedule. I felt d that everything I did was worth nothing because they were killing the ECW after they revived it. Um, I felt like everything I was doing was just starting to put me in a deeper and deeper hole because I had a real life outside of the job that you neglect to do this job on that schedule. And so everything, I just needed a break. And, and what I knew what I needed to do was work on my spirit. That was all the priority. So one of my values is uh, priorities. Look at your own priorities. What's the most important to you? List your own priorities. That's going to help you right there because you got to know yourself in order to make changes. Y you do. And, um, and then, and, and also to notice the changes. But um, so w when it comes to priorities, my spirit became more important than anything else because I didn't say I'm going to let my body go to shit. I just knew I already got that. Let me go ahead and put that on cruise control. Let me put my mind on cruise control. Let me focus on my spirit. Why is there so much negative energy? How do I get it healthy again? And you know what? That was 2007 and it's still my priority. So... Yeah. Yeah, so I make decisions sometimes based on that. You know, is this going to bring me happiness? And then I weigh out, is it going to do irreparable harm to my body? No. Is it going to do irreparable harm to my mind? No. I mean, if it is, if it's something like, I'm going to quit working out and just eat ice cream, you know, obviously, well, that's not a healthy thing. But if it's if it's something, you know, for me, it could be, you know, a drink. It could be like, um, hey, you know what? just like it's meant to, this drink is going to lift my spirits. What's the downside? There's not really a big one because I am i don't have the issues that other people have where they drink drink too much, uh, they're alcoholics, they're, you know, their priorities change, that becomes their priority. I don't have a, you know, where it's, where it's going to interfere with my life like that. So um, if I, you know, if it, if it elevates my spirit, and I weigh out what else the harm is, is minimal. Boom. That's how I make my decisions and stuff. So when I say uh, to not worry about what uh, anybody else thinks about you, think about what's important to you. Think about who's important to you. Think about how important it is to you, how other people see you. Throw that on your list. Um, you know, which, you know, that's your image, you know, the image that, that you put out there or how they translate that. And both are important in how you're seen by them. But, um, and, and ultimately, um, you know, I, this was our ideology last week was get your validation from yourself, not from others, because that's where the true pressure of conforming comes in. And, and I will for my lifetime resent trying to fit in as a kid and not knowing, you know, what shoes are the cool shoes to wear. And, you know, how come I can't afford a, a big red sports car like the other kids, you know, and just the whole thing is, it's such a waste, in my opinion, to put your energy on that, unless that's important to you. To, for me, the way that people see me is still important, but not in that way, not in a fictitious, uh, in, in, a, in a materialistic way like that. So instead, 
man, I take a lot of pride. And when people say I'm a good guy or I'm honest or they trust me or I'm genuine, I'm down to earth, I'm one of the coolest people they've met, or if they talk about my physical uh, attributes and say I'm the, the best wrestler ever to do it in the business, you know what? It's important to me that people see me in a good light. But if they're going to base, uh, base whether I'm good or not on, on the clothes that I wear, then that's just not important to me. Yeah. How did you get your spirit right? Would you say when you when you really focused on your spirit? What did you kind of what kind of steps did you take? When you- it, it, it's just prioritizing, and it's like uh, it's like it, paying attention to the vi- my, my my own vibration, and staying away from the negative things, and spending more time on the things that 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 make you vibrate in a positive way. I mean, for a lot of people, it could be their favorite music could be a favorite movie. You could just have go-tos that like, boom, put you in that mood. But if you sit around and you mope all day, that's a negative vibration. It's not good for your spirit. You're not going to get uh, any better. You know, they say time heals all wounds, but it's also because with enough time, you got to learn to stop telling yourself that same story over and over and over again. Oh, I'm so fucked. I'm so fucked. You know, it's like, yeah, okay. You spend enough time telling yourself that now let's, let's, Let's get a different story because there's definitely different angles to look at everything. So for me, I mean, like I said, I haven't reprioritized to where, you know, maybe I'd be a lot more jacked if I was like, boom, body's most important, getting up at eight o'clock in the morning every day, working out for two hours. But instead, for me, I wake up and I'm like, I got to be in a good mood. I want to drink coffee. I want to have my doobies. I want to get my vibration right. That's my spirit. And, and it really, all three of them have to be aligned and have to be in working order to be whole. And I'm amazed that I never paid attention to that until like 2007, 2006 or whatever. And, and a lot of people don't as well. They just they just don't. Maybe they don't even know they have a spirit, but it's so important. Uh, and when you're out of line, it affects everything and it keeps you from being connected to your own path in life. It really does. Man, Rob, that's great stuff. Little Jay even says, RVD speaking some facts. Holy shit, man. I really needed to hear this. Awesome. That's great to hear. That's great to hear. So, so we know we're not wasting our time, man. So yeah, that's the thing is I, I still, um, my, my spirit is is more important to me. And again, you know, I, I work on my mind. I work on my body. I got that. I got that going, but my spirit, it's that constant work, always trying to improve. And I'm always trying to, as the song says, get a little bit higher. Yeah, that's it. (laughs) <laughs> it has to do with increasing my spiritual vibration because the higher my vibration is the better me i am the happier i am the the better i feel but the better version of me i am and i've been trying to explain that for years and uh you know i think this is a good good way to put it so that's that's how uh that's how i do it nice i remember ddp saying telling the story too when jake when he jake roberts when he first got him into like his can't remember the name of the house DDP called it, the accountability thing or something they called it. Either way, he was saying that when Jake was going through his struggles, he was always wearing negative t-shirts, like negative with negative quotes on them and stuff like that. And DDP like, change that shit off. Take it, change it. Like you want positive in your life. You want all this stuff. And like they, he got rid of those shirts and they put like it was just another thing that he got a made you gotta think a positive attitude kind of thing about that. That's yeah when you so yeah when you think about it in the most simplistic terms that's like manifesting physically the world around you by literally placing or taking away things that are either positive or negative Mm -hmm. and you know i i'm not good at negative energy i'm not good at being angry i'm not good at being sad not being i'm not good at being worried and these are things that um i don't struggle with i accept them and um i'm i'm okay with that's that's me and i you know i think people look at really who you are and i'm not saying you know find an easy excuse to to not work on things that need work on but i am saying that you know for me like i I, i'm late i'm always fucking late Uh, And I'm not saying I couldn't change that. I know there's people listening to this. They're like, right there, that's a sign of someone that's not willing to grow. Dude, fuck it. I'm saying I am habitually late. I'm not good at judging time. 
I am in the ring. I can go out there and tell you when it's 14 minutes and fucking ring the bell. But when, uh, when it comes to, I got five minutes left till I got to leave in my mind, I think I still have time to go brush my teeth. Yeah. I'm that way too. But yeah. I changed my clothes. And, but I've been like that always, always, always my whole life. Like I was the last one on the school bus you know, I wouldn't wake up until I, I've only got 20 minutes to grab everything and leave for the school bus. And then I'd be the last one. Sometimes I'd miss the bus once in a while, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm the last one on the plane very, very often. The only one in the business that ever competed with me on that was Jeff Hardy. <laughs> we were always the last two on the plane every time. Um, but uh, anyway, um, get to know yourself. Look at your own priorities and should write some stuff down think about how important things are in comparison to other things you know what do you want out of life and uh all that stuff man it's it's amazing to do some self-exploration and then you come out to realize a lot of what you do it makes a lot of sense it never made sense before it's like oh no wonder fucking you know no no wonder I'm, I'm I'm never there on time. It's it's not as important to me as rolling a doobie, right? <laughs> <laughs> For example, but yeah. Uh, yeah, cool man. Glad I could help, and I think we covered some a lot of our videology and a lot of everything in this episode. We really did. Yeah, we had a couple super chats sneak in too. Unsweet T says, "Hey Rob, curious if you ever watched Californication. Sometimes you come off a little." Hank Moody esque. I've never seen it. I wonder how so, but I loved it. I watched every single episode. Hey, there you go. Sweet. Yeah, I'll you know, I was, living, I was living in California, so I really liked all the the scenery. You know, they would show all these scenes, like, dude, I just rode my bike there at Venice Beach, and he, yeah, and it was really entertaining. I like David Duchovny's character. I like the daughter. The whole thing. Yeah, I, I, I I'm not really sure how to compare me, but that's cool. You know, I'm trying, I'm thinking of his vibe and maybe it was a California vibe. He was a writer, um, but it seems like he spent most of his time not writing, <laughs> drinking, that's usually what writers partying, do. <laughs> partying, looking for girls and stuff like that. Yeah. So, that's know, usually what I take that as a compliment. Yeah, there you go. And then uh, Corey, I can answer this one for you. He says, sorry to hold you up. I don't know if this is an option, but how could I get in touch to discuss a possible interview and prices, et cetera? Email me, Corey, at dpdangelo, my last name, D-E-A-N-G-E-L-O. That's D-P as in Paul D'Angelo at gmail.com. And we can you can inquire about me. It would, I, can, I can try to handle that for you and see what happens. So cool. Rob, this was a great episode, man. This was a lot of fun. Cool. A lot of ground. Yeah, it, uh, it usually is. And we got a we got a peak. Uh, first peek at uh, this outfit, which will be appearing along with the whole FN show and these muscles, which, man, they're going to be even bigger by fucking uh, by Wednesday. And um, hey, do you think that when we swear it affects the algorithm? Like everyone? Every yes, I think it does. I've been hearing that more often now. So, and I know uh, Conan's podcast; they bleep out all the cuss words in there. The, the the stuff I watch with the police and courts and everything, they don't say kill. They don't say gun anymore. They, is there, you think it's better to do an editing program or you think maybe we should stop uh, swearing or we should just keep it real? Well, I gave up swearing for Lent, so I, we, we're, I'm good. But <laughs> maybe not, though, because sometimes I'm sure I swear. We could try. I, I'm, gonna look I just notice, I'm noticing whenever I, I swear, like, as I'm doing it, I'm like, fuck, I just said another swear word. I didn't think it did, to be honest. I didn't think it affected it, but I'm hearing it more and more that it is affecting the algorithm. So, you know, we're going to do some, I'll do some research and we can uh, make some adjustments moving forward. We'll see how it goes. Uh, oh, we do have another $5 super chat real quick. Oh, she just said, uh, little Jane just said, much love to, love to you, Rob Van Dam and Dom. Thank you for being awesome. Awesome. Right on, man. Appreciate you. Yeah, I enjoy, enjoy doing these things live. I'm glad we thought of doing that and then actually spending the real time with them and time, everyone else can watch later. Mm -hmm. Guys, you can check it out uh, at RVD's YouTube channel if you go to the, at the Real RVD there on YouTube or go to our new YouTube channel, rvdtv.com, 
We have full episodes drop every Monday at 4.20 p.m. Then we'll have exclusive clips. I got some more plans coming forward. We'll see what happens with that. But rvdtv.com, like, subscribe. Uh, definitely do a five-star review on uh, Apple Podcast and Spotify. And, uh, yeah, just spread the word, guys. Spread the word. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, Rob, we will see you now. Hey, kick some ass uh, this Wednesday. L- lay the hammer down, whoever you yeah, got to do. You know? Yeah, and, I, and I'm thinking uh, maybe, oh, shit. Uh, Friday's the is Friday, Friday's the 23rd. Friday is, I believe, wait, next Friday? Yeah. I think. So, oh, yeah, it would be. We have to do it. I guess I got to do it Thursday, the day I get back. We could do the weekend again, or we could try Monday, that following Monday again, if you want to do live on Monday. Mm, Let's plan on uh, Thursday. Plan on Thursday. The 22nd. 22nd. Even though I'm traveling and I'm tired and dopey, what's the difference? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we can make it short if need be too. So right, that's always an option. But always these people keep us people keep us going though. Or, I know they keep us uh, cooking. Uh, the Rob Van Dam fam, I appreciate the questions and the conversation, and I'm stoked that we got our music back because right. uh, that puts me in the right mood when I'm uh, when I hear that, and then I it plays in my head like for hours afterwards. Yeah, you know, now it, it reminds me and Katie and D of our trip to Hawaii yeah. because we played it a lot there. Did you uh, got? That's awesome. But yeah, we would just get the phone out and set it down on the table if we were out somewhere hanging out. Um, okay, so the, the the chat time is a different time zone than me, obviously, because. Uh, yeah, that, I think that's uh, my time, Eastern Standard Time, eight forty. Is that what's showing up on yours? Well, I haven't got to back to the. I'm 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 at five at four thirty right now. Oh, okay. So I guess I gotta scroll away. Further down then. Further oh, down would be there's yeah. the super chat you asked me. I beat to my own drum. Yeah, I've always heard that, you know, and it's like um it's it's something that like for like I like obviously for me, that's one of the most that's uh, as far as my priorities and the way that people see me um it's important to me that that i stand for being different i don't know i don't know why i guess i'll have to dive into one and looking at why is that so important to me but i guess because i resent forced conformity so much it's so stupid you know and i'm not into you what you're doing you know and like i don't care if every other boy in the class is break dancing if they look stupid to me I should be able to have my own opinion to think they look ridiculous <laughs> and think that I shouldn't have to be forced to do that and look stupid too. You know, my opinion should be valid. And I guess that's what it is, but it's always been important to me. So when someone says, you know, that I'm definitely um, one of a kind or whatever, I always think like, good, you know, I'm glad that, glad that people see me as that because when I look at the status quo, I don't want to be that. Rob, you were the first to make me aware of the dance face. So now anytime I see somebody dancing, I immediately check that out. And be yeah. like, All right. Point, if you point it out to them, they'll be insecure about their own dance face forever. Right. Why, 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 do, you do, that? <laughs> why do you do that? Why do you do that? All right, guys. We'll see you next week here on One of a Kind with RBD. Boom. Bam. Watch me Wednesday.